welcome you to the 13th annual Tsai Lecture. The Tsai Lecture is the Asia Center's flagship lecture series. It was established with a generous gift from Felix Tsai and his family to bring to Harvard notable academics, government officials, business leaders, and other specialists to give a public lecture. The first Tsai Lecture was delivered in 2006 by Professor Wang Gung Wu of the National University of Singapore. And the most recent Tsai Lecture was given last October by the late Surin Pitsuan, former Secretary General for ASEAN. Today, we're delighted to welcome the Honorable Kevin Rudd, President of the Asia Society Policy Institute, former Prime Minister of Australia, and former Foreign Minister of Australia. Introducing Kevin Rudd this afternoon will be Professor Ezra Vogel, the founding director of the Asia Center, and Henry Ford II, Professor of Social Sciences Emeritus in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. So please join me in welcoming Professor Vogel. Thank you very much, Karen. I think it's been a great day for the Asia Center, and it's a great privilege uh, to be the one that gets to introduce Kevin Rudd. As you know, Kevin Rudd is a very special person. He's a person who's held the highest office in his, his own country and who's also a serious scholar and a serious uh, student of China. Uh, we're very fortunate that he came here. He was uh, rushing to do a CNN interview just before he came. He got back from China 10 days ago. Uh, he's been in several other cities in the last few days, and he's in proper demand uh, all over the world. Um, as you know, uh, he's also a China specialist. His uh, Chinese name is Lu Kewen. Da Lu de Lu, Kefu de Ke, nigga, Wen Xue de Wen. So he's been a very a serious student of China. Now, uh, it happens that this is the 20th anniversary. Now, just 20 years before the Senate was started, there was a very prophetic lecture series uh, here at Harvard on the Pacific community. And the person who gave those lectures was Guff Whitlam. Uh, Guff Whitlam was a member of the Socialist Party of Australia and was Prime Minister of Australia. And so I think it's, it's unusually fitting that you know, 20, uh, 40 years after Guff Whitlam did that, our center was founded 20 years later. 20 years later now, we have another prime minister from Australia. I think Australia is especially important because if you think the various countries around the world, which country that really has a Western culture, Western uh, racial background uh, is so close to Asia, so closely situated that it gets involved in so many issues uh, from Asia. Now, you may wonder how a farm boy from Queensland uh, ended up as a China specialist. Uh, there are rumors that um, his mother gave him a book on the archaeology of China. Uh, but in any case, uh, he got to Australian National University, where he studied under Pierre Reckman. Uh, some of you may know who Pierre Reckman is. Uh, he was a very intense Belgian. Uh, who had been uh, in China and is extremely brilliant and very uh, passionate about uh, all kinds of issues. And so he inspired uh, Kevin, and he also Kevin also became a friend of Jeremy Barmay. Uh, and uh, uh, while uh, he was an undergraduate, he, he specialized in Sung poetry. Uh, and uh, he also wrote his thesis on Wei Jing Shun, uh, you know, who was... Uh, the person who talked about the fifth kind of, uh, <clears throat> uh, talked about democracy is the fifth modernization, and that was uh, Kevin's uh, undergraduate. Then uh, after uh, Kevin uh, uh, left uh, ANU, uh, he also joined the foreign ministry, and for, uh, during the 80s, he was a member of the foreign ministry, served in Shanghai and other places in the world, and uh, therefore was interested in other parts of Asia as well as uh, China. And uh, then he became uh, prime minister uh, and, uh, in the year uh, 2007 to 10, and again in 2013. And then after he left uh, the prime ministership, we were fortunate in getting to come uh, to Harvard. Uh, and so he's come to Harvard. He's been so conscientious about his task here today as, a, as an academic 
that he went back and in order to talk about the worldview, China's worldview, he actually did more research on the Marxism and, and how Chinese think about the worldview. And he also took the time to write out his speech, which is uh, going beyond the call of duty. And I think we're just very lucky that he's willing to be with us. Without further ado, Kevin Wright. Thank you so much, Ayers. First of all, pardon my voice. I sound a little bit like Mae West today. I've been uh, flying. I don't look like Mae West, but I, uh, <laughs> I've been uh, flying uh, to China, to Australia, and then here. And so when I arrived here in the, the world's oldest democracy, my voice disappeared, um, <laughs> unlike the president of the world's oldest democracy, whose voice is always, it seems, intact. And on Twitter, the... Um, but I, I do appreciate the May West doctrine of, uh, of uh, politics, which is that it's always much better to be looked over than to be overlooked. So I uh, therefore apologise for my advice in advance. Good to be back at Harvard, which I regard as my second home. Uh, this, this, these guys and girls here gave me political asylum once I came second in our national elections at the end of 2013. Uh, for our Chinese friends, that means I lost. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and I'm still here to tell the story, um, just. The, um, and so uh, it was great to be able to come here and spend a year at Belfer and with colleagues here in Fairbank and across the university working on the central subject of our times, which is the future of US-China relations. Um, and uh, when I was here, I was able to work on a paper which we released in 2015 entitled The Future of US-China Relations Under President Xi Jinping, A Call for a New Strategy of Constructive Realism. Um, I stand by what I wrote then. That was in a pre-Trump world. Uh, I hope to publish again soon, hopefully early next year, uh, The Future of US-China Relations Under President Trump. Um, and then I'm going to, the subtitle will be A Call for a New Tremendous Piece of Very Big, Beautiful Mario Lago Chocolate Cake. <laughs> uh, that's the working title. Any other suggestions I'd greatly receive. But I think it's innovative and tasty. <laughs> Tremendously tasty. <clears throat> and thank you for extending me this invitation to deliver the 13th Thai Lecture here at the Asia Centre at Harvard. Uh, the first Psy Lecture, as was mentioned before by Ezra, was delivered by friend, colleague, mentor, Wang Gong Wu, uh, an extraordinary Sinologist. Um, and uh, when I was a, <clears throat> uh, a humble undergraduate, he was a genuine academic inspiration to those of us at the Australian National University in those days, <clears throat> interested in the study of China. Um, being irreverent Australians, Wang Gong Wu uh, we christened first then One Gun Wu and then Six Gun Wu, if you got if you got on the wrong side of him. But that's what Australians do. They reduce the sophisticated to the banal very quickly. So I'm very honoured, uh, Ezra, to join One Gun Wu's company uh, in delivering this lecture today. As I am honoured to be joined by so many distinguished sinologists. Um, I don't wish to name them all, but I, Ezra is with us. Uh, his extraordinary contribution to scholarship. Rod McFarquhar, I see, is with us as well, and many other colleagues in the room. So thank you for honouring me with your company. Um, and thank you to the Centre in honouring your 20th anniversary and for having me here for this occasion. Today I wish to address um, a simple subject, China's changing worldview under Xi Jinping. I use simple with an Australian sense of irony, because it ain't simple. <clears throat> It's also the subject of my own personal research project at present at the Oxford China Centre, I presume a rival institution. Um, it's in the United Kingdom. Um, <coughs> and uh, and uh, that's from where those of us of convict origins originally came. <laughs> they claim still to be on the right side of the law. Uh, we, regrettably, were on the wrong side of the law. Uh, and my forebears were all criminals. <coughs> First, what I'm seeking to do in this research project, however, is to identify the defining characteristics of China's official worldview, using the term Xi Jiaguan, um, and as it's evolving under President Xi Jinping. 
Second, seeking to identify the extent of continuity and change in China's worldview compared with the Chinese Communist Party leaders who have most recently preceded Xi Jinping. And third, if this change is occurring, asking the question, why? So why do worldviews matter? Very simply, let me put it in these terms. Um, it depends very much on whether countries and their national governments and political institutions take seriously the notion of official worldviews or language to that equivalent effect. Some do, others don't. The Chinese certainly do. Secondly, of course, it depends axiomatically on the relative size of the regional and global footprint of the country in question. I think we'd all conclude here today that in China's case, it's rather large. And thirdly, there's already a reasonably large body of literature deploying different frameworks of analysis that has sought to define at various stages in history uh, what an American worldview, Russians, Soviet, Japanese, British, German, French, Spanish worldviews might be. These analyses have usually sought to explain the national and international behaviours of the leaders, governments and broader political cultures of these states at various times in history. There is also a parallel literature on China, both for the various periods of classical Chinese history, as well as for the Marxist, Maoist and post-Mao periods of the hundred year long evolution of the Chinese Communist Party since 1921. What is different today, however, is something pretty basic. It is the sheer scale of China's emerging presence and influence and power, not only in its immediate region, but now around the world at large. This is reflected across most domains. The sheer size, speed of change, and changing international profile of China's economy, its foreign policy presence, as well as its military capability, underline the absolute importance of understanding China's changing worldview. How the Chinese state actually views its standing, place, and future in the region and the world now matters for most governments in the region and the world, not just for China itself. So whereas an analysis of China's historical worldview might always have been of legitimate interest to both Sinologists and the wider academy, it's now also a matter of increasing urgency and importance for policymakers in all global capitals, including Beijing itself. And it is the one question I get asked in every capital in the world. What is China's worldview under Xi Jinping? So I thought I should have a go at it. Let's go, however, back to some Marxist fundamentals. That is, what do we mean by this term worldview and how has it evolved within the Chinese conceptual world uh, in a country still ruled by the Communist Party? This term, Shi Guan. Well, in the West, the term worldview comes from the German Weltanschauung, uh, which was first used, albeit fleetingly, by Immanuel Kant in 1790 before undertaking a long conceptual evolution through Hegel, Kierkegaard, Heidegger, Marx, Engels, and then Freud. For Kant, Weltanschauung, or worldview, simply meant our perception of the world as mediated by our senses. Hegel took Kant's concept further by incorporating into it his own idealist understanding of human progress through the dialectical processes of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, each of which involved different worldviews, although all progressing towards a common absolute good. Hegel also conceived of different individual and national worldviews, laying the early conceptual groundwork for Chinese theorists, such as Deng Xiaoping's generation, and their idea of socialism with Chinese characteristics as a legitimate epistemological category, a means of breaking the ideological stranglehold of universal communist ideology. Hegelian concepts of worldview would later cause philosopher Richard Rorty, for example, to note that the notion of alternative conceptual frameworks has become commonplace in our culture since Hegel. In other words, it was this rich German philosophical tradition of the late 18th and early 19th centuries that gave rise to the idea that universal realities could nonetheless be perceived through different prisms, in turn giving rise to different worldviews, either individually or collectively. Although in Hegel's idealist schema, these ultimately found common purpose through the dialectics of historical and human progress. 
It was this specific imprint of Hegel's concept of dialectics as further developed by Marx and particularly Engels in their related theories of dialectical and historical materialism that brings us along this long and torturous road to current Chinese usage of the term worldview. Dialectical materialism became an explanation of the content of historical change, but also as a method of reasoning about the mechanisms of historical change, as well as the means of accelerating material change through conscious political action, the Leninist party. This new discipline of dialectical materialism was to be applied throughout a new worldview constructed through the insights of historical materialism. This new interpretation of history would provide the temporal framework within which the dynamics of dialectical materialism would play out. In this view, it was only through the dynamics of class struggle over the course of human history that human progress could be achieved. For Marxists, dialectical materialism became the scientific machinery of all human progress, both in the physical sciences, including Darwinian evolution, but also in the social sciences, including politics, sociology, and economics. In other words, dialectical materialism became a comprehensive worldview in itself, embracing all dom domains of knowledge, as well as a method of scientific analysis to be deployed within and between these different knowledge domains, and ultimately as a means to determine how to act in history, not to just observe it. Because of dialectical and historical materialism's claim to scientific exactitude, certainty, universality, and above all, objectivity, its adherents, by definition, rejected the possibility of any alternative worldviews as inherently unscientific and therefore irrelevant to any legitimate debate on political reality, consciousness, ideation, or action. As Marx himself famously observed, quote, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways, whereas the point is to change it, unquote. For Marx, the end state of change through the mechanism of class struggle was a communist society in which all material human needs are met, sufficient, are met sufficiently, equally, and without class exploitation. It was this uncompromising dialectical materialist view of the world that found its way into China. Not long after the collapse of the Qing Dynasty in 1911, the Russian Revolution of 1917, and the emergence of the fledgling Chinese Communist Party in 1921. The impact of Leninist, Stalinist, and later Soviet conceptualizations of a Marxist worldview on the newly formed Chinese Party were profound. Chinese Communist Party members, activists, and intellectuals, including uh, Chu Qiubai, Ai Seqing, Li Da, and later Mao Zedong, engaged in the monumental task of interpreting the overall Marxist canon including the earliest expositions of the term worldview, dialectical materialism, and historical materialism in Chinese. Through until the end of the Yan'an period in 45, when we see the formal emergence of Mao Zedong thought as an official addition to what had previously been inscribed simply, described simply as Marxist-Leninist theory, Chinese renditions of Soviet interpretations of Marxist history had generally been consistent with the original texts. Even Mao's 1937 work on the contradictions among the people adhered in the main to the concept of dialectical materialism as applied to the challenge of class struggle in the context of China's prevailing historical circumstances as a peasant rather than a proletarian society. But starting from 1945, we see a series of concerted efforts by Chinese Marxist theoreticians to liberate Chinese Marxism from what they increasingly perceived as the shackles of Soviet ideological dogma. Chinese indigenous Marxist worldview as a, conscious, as a consequence underwent a series of transformations that sought to deal with a new series of historical realities. These included the Chinese party obtaining political power in 49, no longer a revolutionary party but a governing party. The Sino-Soviet split following Khrushchev's denunciation of Stalin in 58. The Cultural Revolution between 66 and 76. The party's formal re-evaluation of Mao and Mao Zedong thought in 1980, including Mao's calamitous impact on the country through the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. And this culminated in the post-78 period of socialism with Chinese characteristics under Deng Xiaoping 
as the party sought to grapple with a new set of theoretical challenges arising from the leadership's decision to turn much of remaining Marxist orthodoxy on its head, embracing the demands of pro-market reforms at home, as well as comprehensive engagement in, interna in international product services and capital markets abroad. Under Deng, class struggle, previously the core political dynamic of dialectical and historical materialism was marginalised in the party's new framework. This was reflected both within China and in the cessation of China's support for revolutionary movements abroad. In its place, Chinese theoreticians applying a new approach to the principles of historical materialism concluded that because China was only at the earliest stages of socialism, the core practical and theoretical challenges in the current period was to fully develop the country's productive forces, thereby creating the conditions for a much more advanced form of socialism in the future. In other words, get out there and make as much money as you can. That's the best thing you can do for socialism with Chinese characteristics. Furthermore, for this to occur, China would have to apply a form of socialism which addressed China's particular national characteristics, thereby representing a further departure from traditional socialist worldviews of the past. So whereas the content of the Chinese Communist Party's official worldview may therefore have changed significantly over the last century of the party's history, including in this new period, Xin Shidai, of Xi Jinping's leadership and thought, what is remarkable for me as I read this stuff uh, is that the Marxist methodological framework through which these worldviews have been developed in the past has remained formally intact in the way in which the party internally thinks about things. Indeed, in January 2015, Xi Jinping himself presided over a formal study session of the CPC Politburo, <clears throat> which was reported in the People's Daily under the heading continue to deploy both the worldview, theory, and method of dialectical materialism in solving fundamental problems in the development of China's reform program, unquote. Now, there's a snappy headline for the New York Post. General Xi Jinping, General Secretary Xi Jinping stated that in dealing with all of the country's core challenges, we must deploy the accumulated wisdom of Marxism, consciously harness the even greater effort uh, with even greater effort, the worldview, Shi Jiaguan, theory and method of dialectical materialism and strengthen our dialectical and strategic way of thinking. She stated that party leaders should regard contradictions, Ma Dun, as a normal part of a Marxist worldview and that a dialectical method of problem solving included the recognition of objective universal contradictions, his words, not mine, arising from given actions and counter actions that they generated. And just in case Politburo members thought all this might have been just for political show and form alone, Xi Jinping reminded them, <coughs> his colleagues, that this particular session had followed the 11th study session of the party's leading organ in 2013, which had focused exclusively on historical materialism, that is, the theoretical twin sister of dialectical materialism in the rarefied world of China's professional dialecticians. So while, China, while Marxist dialectics may have died their official death in Russia with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, my point to you today is pretty simple. They remain alive and well in the Chinese Communist Party worldview of the 21st century. Therefore, given the continuing centrality of the theories of dialectical and historical materialism to the contemporary Chinese concept of worldview, the question arises to how we should usefully define this term worldview for the point of view of our analysis today. One approach, which I think is too narrow, is simply to regard worldview as primarily a Marxist methodology for arriving at different conclusions at different times in the party's history about the objective state of the world. That is, using the dialectical framework of action and reaction, of thesis, antithesis and synthesis of contradictions, as discussed earlier in my remarks. A different approach would be to disregard worldview as a methodology, but instead focus on the more productive exercise, perhaps, of analysing the actual content of the formal conclusions reached by the party at various times in history about the nature of China's domestic and external circumstances and the party's proposed response to those circumstances. 
what's currently termed, for example, in China today as a period of great strategic opportunity. What does that mean? How is that reached by way of a formal conclusion within the internal deliberations of the party? A third approach would be to ignore all official Chinese formulations of worldview altogether uh, on the grounds that independent academic inquiry on the international behaviour of states, including China, should not be limited to the public grounds offered by the governments of those states <coughs> uh, on why they are acting in a particular way and how they justify their actions. In other words, it's important to avoid one level or another of official or, for that matter, conceptual capture by using these sorts of terms. I understand that. The problem with this approach, however, is that it raises the fundamental and methodological problem of how those of us on the outside of the inner sanctums of the Chinese Communist Party and state actually know what the leadership really believes about the world and their response to it beyond the formal statements that they from time to time may make on these subjects. Each of these approaches that I've described just now, the first and the second and the third one, uh, have their deficiencies. My proposed definition, therefore, of worldview in seeking to understand what China is now doing tries to embrace all three. This is because, despite some of the more impenetrable formalisms of Marxist epistemology in general, and its Chinese ideological variants in particular, my point is how the Ch party formally ideates its view of the world and how the party in turn communicates its political response to the world, it so observes, actually matters. It provides us with insights into the world of internal ideological constraints and opportunities that confront a party which continually formally describes itself as Marxist-Leninist. It is certainly Leninist, but my contention to you today is it is also in part, in its conceptual framework, Marxist as well. Therefore, it gives us some guidance to the party's changing ideological, political and policy priorities over time. Moreover, where new conceptual language is deployed, particularly in a political and institutional culture which is notoriously conservative in its approach to linguistic innovation, it invites us to examine what new realities it is seeking to describe when new language emerges. When Xin Shidai emerges as a new term, what is meant by that? Or is it simply a public relations slogan? For these various reasons, China's worldview should therefore be defined, in my judgment, as the Chinese Communist Party's conclusions, both formal and informal, about the changing nature of the world around them, the strategic threats and opportunities that the world so understood represents for China, as well as how the Chinese party and state should respond, and this being done through a formal internal ideational process. So, having argued why the concept of worldview is important in understanding China's changing international behaviour and how the concept itself has evolved over time as a Marxist framework of analysis, as well as what it means as an organising principle in the Chinese Communist Party today, the real question I suppose we're interested in is what do we judge China's worldview under Xi Jinping to be today? I offer the following tentative conclusions. I am simply a research scholar. I'm always prepared for the evidence to take me in different directions as my own personal research project on this question continues. But I think a number of trends are becoming clear. The argument I advance is that there has indeed been a profound qualitative shift in China's worldview under Xi Jinping compared with the previous prevailing orthodoxies under Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao. This can be seen in a number of critical domains. We see it in the evolution of a new worldview which no longer accepts, passively or otherwise, American global or regional hegemony as consistent with Chinese national identity, political ideology or long-term core national interests. We also see a worldview, a Shi Jiaguan, which has now concluded that both the global and regional liberal orders that have been built by the United States are in a period of deep transition, presenting China with a new period of strategic opportunity to bring about changes to these orders. Moreover, in China's new worldview, Beijing does not intend to become a co-chair or replacement chair of the existing liberal international order. 
but instead seeks to craft a regional order in East Asia where Chinese interests are accorded primary consideration by neighbouring states, and a global order which uh, reduces existing norms in international humanitarian intervention, human rights and other classically liberal domains. Although in both cases, the regional and the global, China will engage in a process of rolling incremental negotiations with both the United States, its allies and other states to optimise the results that they seek rather than seek to impose these changes, certainly not imposing them by force. Furthermore, these deep conclusions concerning China's emerging worldview has resulted in the formal abandonment uh, of Deng Xiaoping's orthodoxy of hide your strength, bide your time, never take the lead. Pa guang yang hui, jue bo dang tou. And its official replacement with a new period of foreign defense and ec international economic policy innovation, activism, and contestation, albeit within a still fluid ideational framework of China's amendment to or replacement of the existing liberal international order. Finally, I argue that this new worldview is now reflected in a new culture of policy innovation, apparent in multiple policy domains, including major changes unfolding in China's bilateral diplomacy and its multilateral diplomacy through the UN system. From a Chinese historical perspective, I argue that China is therefore entering into a third phase in the evolution of its official worldview since the birth of the People's Republic in 1949. From Mao's Marxist realist approach between 49 and 76, characterized by ideological confrontation with both the US and then with the Soviet Union, combined with a strategic realignment with Washington to deal with the later realist threats it perceived from Moscow, through Deng's liberal realist period between 78 and 2013, where China embraces uh, China's embrace of the US-led liberal international order was accompanied by parallel, albeit profoundly uneven, processes of domestic economic and to some extent political liberalization, and now an emerging Xi Jinping nationalist realist period since 2013, where a new divergence is unfolding. On the one hand, we see China's increasingly authoritarian, mercantilist, and nationalist domestic order, while on the other hand, we see a continuing global order where liberal internationalist assumptions continue to prevail, but which are now subject to challenges on multiple fronts, including from Xi Jinping's China. From a global perspective, I argue further that China is therefore accelerating the processes of change that are now confronting the current global order. So why is this happening? <clears throat> if I'm right about these changes, and I may not be, <clears throat> then what is driving it? I argue that these reasons are both foreign and domestic. They are driven by realist calculations by Chinese elites concerning the relative decline in American power based on long-standing methodologies for the estimation of comprehensive national power, a conclusion that the United States is becoming less predisposed to deploying power unilaterally, as well as increasing evidence of growing global multipolarity in multiple international policy domains. <clears throat> China's changing worldview is, however, also significantly shaped by, <clears throat> by a range of domestic factors. These include official conclusions concerning the changing structure uh, of the Chinese economy, most significantly Chinese calculations that China will be less globally dependent in the future, compared with the first 35 years of its economic transformation process, because of the growing importance of its domestic market relative to foreign trade, investment, and technology transfers. Another domestic driver of China's changing worldview is nationalism. Nationalism has become a major legitimizing force in Chinese domestic politics for the Chinese Communist Party. Chinese nationalism is compounded by the complex politics of identity in relation to China's self-perception of its imperial past, the aggression of the West towards China, including by Japan, uh, and this Communist Party's long-standing campaign of national victimhood as a result of a century of foreign humiliation from 1839 to 1949, reinforced with this new campaign of national renaissance. Nationalism has both fueled and justified the emergence of this new Chinese worldview, which cannot be a derivative of the West, but one which once again rightly places China 
at the centre of the regional and global order. Ideology provides a further domestic political factor in support of a changing Chinese worldview. <clears throat> As noted above, there is a widening dissonance between the political values championed within China, that is the assertion of communist orthodoxy, including the concept of an authoritarian China model on the one hand, and the foundational values of a liberal international order of which China has been an informal part on the other. The prospects of convergence between these two sets of values is less evident now than at any time since the events of 1989. Divergences that I see are in fact increasingly the norm. This has meant that rather than China being prepared to continue to internalize the liberalizing pressures from the external order, China is now seeking to change aspects of the external order to make it less incompatible with China's continuing domestic arrangements. Finally, of course, of greater importance than all of these other factors is the political personality of Xi Jinping, Xi Dada. <laughs> I argue that the strength of Xi Jinping's character, his sense of history, his sense of mission, his sense of destiny, his deep nationalism, his ideological commitment to both the party's history and its future as the only credible political vehicle to bring about the full restoration of the Chinese nation represent a critical new political factor shaping China's international policy. These factors are compounded by the degree of personal power Xi Jinping has consolidated within the Chinese leadership structure since 2013 and most recently with the decision of the Renda last month. Together, these individual leadership dynamics constitute a decisive factor in the major structural changes we have seen underpinning China's official worldview since 2013. To conclude, the extent to which this worldview proves to be coterminous with Xi Jinping's period in office, or whether it will return to a more ambiguous form as we had in the past in the pre-Xi Jinping period, remains an open question. What we do know is that major changes are afoot in Xi Jinping's China. For me, that seems obvious. And the responsibility of the academy to make sense of these changes for the benefit of policymakers around the world is therefore acute. I'm often asked what an American Western or collective policy response should be to China's changing official worldview. That is an entirely separate question. Um, it's just as important as the first question which I've sought to address today, which is what is China's changing worldview? I had a lot to say about this other question in my 2015 report on US-China relations under Xi Jinping, um, which I call for a new uh, constructive realism. I hope to write an update of that report later this year and early next. <clears throat> but I'm a sufficiently conservative trainee scholar, now that I'm at Oxford, uh, as well as having served in the past as an international policy practitioner to argue that it's important first to get our analysis right of what is actually happening in China's changing view of its own future place in the region and the world under the new great helmsman, Comrade Xi Jinping. Thank you. Uh, what uh, China's uh, thinking is in their worldview now that they're trying to expand around the rest of the world and be persuasive to the rest of the world, <clears throat> um, you made the point, um, uh, you've made the point that uh, China is using the economic leverage with other countries uh, to have an impact on other countries. How well do you think that is going? And when they try to begin to use soft power, when they try to uh, get uh, their CCTV and so forth impact in the rest of the world. How is that going to be received and will the Chinese be smart enough to adapt uh, to the reception? Well, thank you, um, Ezra. I've got something working here now. <clears throat> A couple of thoughts on your question. Um, as I said in my remarks before, what I've tried to do today is explain what I think the evolving uh, Chinese official worldview under Xi Jinping is. Um, and as I said, this is a work in progress, I think, both within China, but also our attempts to understand it. Uh, the question then arises is the extent to which <clears throat> uh, the praxis of the 
uh, growth of China's uh, international policy influence is working or not. So on the economic question, if I was giving a report card to the Standing Committee of the Politburo uh, now, this afternoon, the 13th, Friday the 13th of, uh, <coughs> of April uh, 2018, uh, I'd probably say Carl the Shah, which is uh, you've, uh, you've passed. Uh, so far, you'd get a good 8 out of 10, but it's all. <coughs> Why? Um, for the simple reason is if you go to every region in the world, uh, the net and relative impact of China's economic influence in all categories, trade obviously, but increasingly investment, um, is now <coughs> increasingly uh, dominant, certainly relative to the United States. You know, the economic uh, uh, data from the Asia-Pacific region would have China as a number one trade partner for virtually every country in the region. And in terms, interestingly now, in terms of FDI flows, now probably is the number two source uh, after the United States and probably crossing the threshold of becoming the number one source of FDI before too many years go by. You go to um, Eastern Europe, um, Central Asia, uh, you go to Africa certainly, but also increasingly Central America and, and uh, South America, uh, you see similar patterns emerging. And so what I detect when I speak to political leaders from all these countries is that China's economic presence, influence, and impact on the perception of, let's call it, international politics uh, is um, becoming larger and larger. And China has effectively used this as a leverage of, for its uh, wider foreign policy interests. And so if you look, for example, at one of the things the Chinese state is always concerned about, which is you know, human rights critique, um, the uh, influence it's been able to bring to bear on countries like Greece and the Czech Republic uh, in terms of its uh, economic presence in both countries, has created um, voices which are more sensitive to China's domestic political interests in the councils of the European Union. And China sees this as working potentially in a range of other regional organizations around the world. I think there's a danger in the United States in particular when they look at either Chinese investment in Africa or the future of uh, Idai Lu, uh, One Belt, One Road, or BRI, that has now been rechristened <coughs> to say this is going to re generate such a set of reactions across the developing world. Na tai hola. Du wo cha. Di xi fang cha hao duo. That it will automatically sort of um, uh, almost in a dialectical sense uh, create a set of reactions which will cancel out whatever advantage was sought to be achieved in the first place. You know, that's tempting. I know of the case studies in Africa which it hasn't worked. I've looked at Zambia, I've looked at Botswana, I've spoken to the political leadership in both countries, and they've both got stories to tell. I've also spoken to scholars who specialise in individual and representative series of Chinese development projects across Africa, and the remarkable stories of how uh, Chinese SOEs have actually adapted uh, af over three, five, seven years the way in which they implement projects to make them much more sensitive to local concerns about employment, uh, technology transfer, as well as economic opportunity, payment of taxes, and God knows whatever else. It's a mixed picture. But I would simply say that the default position I often hear in Washington, which is, ah, you know, look at all that bad African reaction. Nah, it's going to happen in Central Asia as well. Don't worry about it. Uh, I think um, that is empirically flawed. It is much more mixed than that. On Chinese soft power, not exactly my field of expertise. I'm not a big movie buff at the best of times. Um, uh, but what I do notice when I go to Beijing, my standard routine is I sit down in the hotel and I watch four hours of central Chinese television. That's what I do. I, I start with the game shows. That's always fun. Uh, and then eventually I get on to uh, CCTV4 and watch the serious stuff, having gone through the military channel, which is CCTV8, which is one of my favourites, because the, <laughs> the guys are always wearing uniforms and there's always a Yue Bing somewhere. Uh, there's always. <laughs> and so, uh, but you know something? Um, the collaboration with Hollywood, um, the uh, increasing sophistication in the Chinese movie industry, particularly in games, um, you know, there's something happening there. 
Uh, and I think, uh, again, there is a slightly outdated American view and Western view that this is going to be unsophisticated in terms of its impact on soft power perceptions and projections around the world. So I wouldn't give uh, China 8 out of 10 by that, but I'd say it'd be sort of a narrow fail at the stage, but getting better. Thank you very much. Now we're now open for uh, questions, and uh, who would like to uh, uh, raise a question? Okay. Um, I see one right here. Hello? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roth, for the great talk. My name is Richard. I'm a PhD student from uh, MIT in uh, applied mathematics. Uh, parallel to the economic expansion of I'm China. I'm intimidated by those two things. <laughs> <laughs> well, three, actually. You're Chinese. You're from MIT, uh, and you're a PhD in mathematics. So. <laughs> so Ezra, you're answering this one, mate. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, you wonder what I'm doing here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so parallel to the economic expansion uh, of China is uh, the uh, fast uh, development of artificial intelligence and its uh, internal infrastructure. Um, uh, on the other hand, in the U.S., we are less concerned about uh, technology and infrastructure and more concerned about building, building walls between the U.S. and Mexico, uh, which has resulted in unfortunate situations such as, um, you know, on your way to, uh, uh, when you were in New York, you had trouble uh, finding a seat and you had to sit on your uh, luggage. You've been, you've been following me on Weibo. Yeah, I did. Uh, <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm sorry about that. So... <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So in, in your in your so what's uh, so there was a there was a recent white paper saying that China wanted to be the leader in artificial intelligence by 2030. Um, given the given given the current situation, uh, how realistic do you think is the goal, and do you foresee a possibility that in the future China will be leading the development of artificial intelligence and machine learning, and U.S. will be falling behind? Well, <coughs> as a graduate in um, uh, Chinese literature, it's, uh, <laughs> 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 let me give you my definitive response to your question. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say this. I'm president of the Asia Society Policy Institute in uh, New York. One of the things we've set up in the last um, six months, and will run for the next few years if there is a market for it, is what we call the Chinese Economic uh, Dashboard. What we do is a very narrow thing. We look at uh, ten barometers of China's economic reform. Um, and the barometers we use are those set out by the Chinese party in Deng De Jue Ding, in the Shiba Part, the San Zhong Quan Hui, Yisan, Yisan, yeah. And, um, <clears throat> and so we look at what the party has set uh, as its barometers for reform. This goes from state-owned enterprise reform, innovation policy reform, uh, down to land reform, and all points in between, foreign trade, investment, in terms of what they said was the problem, where they wanted to go. And secondly, when we analyse progress or regress, uh, we don't look at further policy statements. I'm a politician. I know what politicians do. Make, they make speeches. <laughs> okay? uh, the real stuff happens on the ground and is captured in data. Now, <clears throat> what we try to do is therefore capture as much data as possible around each of these uh, po policy reform undertakings. The one which has really interested me has been what you've done on innovation. Um, and this is again, I think, where there is a considerable uh, misunderstanding in the United States about the emerging sophistication of Chinese innovation. Because without even just believing one set of Chinese official data, and we've all got problems with elements of Chinese official data, but you aggregate a whole bunch of data points, sorry, data points, um, <laughs> um, then you end up with a picture which says that innovation as uh, based firms as a proportion of Chinese gross domestic product is ticking up in a believable trend line. 
not one of those what I describe as Daiyu Jin uh, trend lines, but a believable trend line. Um, something's happening, okay? I think, and we've all got our anecdotes. But again, this kind of hackneyed Western view that oh, Chinese, they can never innovate, too much Confucius, too much memorization, the, you know, it's hopeless. Um, I think there, is, there are deep changes afoot, uh, which is my background proposition in terms of answering your core question about uh, artificial intelligence and the uh, directive put out last year by <coughs> the State Council from memory uh, on the uh, AI strategic mission statement for China through to 2025 and 30. Because AI in all of its advances depends in large part on the uh, adequate investment of highly charged, focused and directed uh, research institutions. I think the Chinese mindset, which is throw a lot of money at this into your state centers of excellence, uh, will get China so far um, and further than I think many in the West think. Um, and we already know where some of those innovations are occurring. Uh, whether it will be Wan Chuan Chung Shu, completely material and the realization of it, I cannot make any prediction whatsoever. What I do know is that. Innovation policy for the last five years has been the number one economic priority. What I see from the statement last year is that within that, artificial intelligence, among a couple of other domains, uh, is now the number one priority within innovation policy. Therefore, for us in the West to simply have a simplistic assumption that Nyah, they'll never do it is just nuts. Um, at least what I've seen in terms of the trend line on innovation generally. So I'm sorry for the non-mathematical answer. Mm -hmm. Mark Elliott. Now I'm equally worried in a different department. He's a serious <laughs> scientologist. Thank you so much, Kevin, for a, a great talk. I want to return to your point on the return of, or, or the persistence, I shouldn't say return, but the persistence of dialectical materialism in worldview uh, of, the, of the party, and in particular Xi Jinping and your comments on the Xin Shidae, on the new era. So we have, well, I shouldn't say we, I have tended to understand the, the new era rhetoric and the rhetoric about the, uh, the Fuxing, uh, the re rejuvenation or renaissance or whatever translation we want to give of the Chinese people. I've understood that primarily in historical terms of a, of a, um, a, a, a a wish to, to uh, bring China back to a pre, uh, pre 19th century, I'd like to say a, a Qianlong era, uh, time of, 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 uh, of, of greatness, of dominance, of, of, of serving as the, the lodestone around which everything in, in the region uh, tends, to, tends to revolve. You've offered us, a, I think, a, a somewhat different model for understanding what, uh, how we might understand, and you've urged us in, to, to, to consider that if, if we don't understand it, in, in, in fact, in in Hegelian terms, uh, then we are missing a, a big part of, of the picture. So my question for you is whether you see the Xin Shidae, the new era, as, as a synthesis, which I'm guessing is the case, and if, that's the, if that is the case, then what is it a synthesis of? And we know that this will then produce a new uh, thesis and antithesis. So if you, if you would be uh, willing to um, speculate a little bit on how you think that this new synthesis is going to develop in the, in the, near, in the near term, say. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great question, Mark. Thank you very much. <coughs> and um, I begin my defense by saying, and I'm not a dialectician either. <coughs> <laughs> but I think Xi Dada is a dialectician um, <coughs> because I'm very taken by the remarks he's used at these study sessions of the Politburo on um, dialectical materialism and historical materialism, the language that he's reported is using about to his Politburo colleagues about how you rationally analyze events um, and therefore deal with emerging events and to use a term which says universal contradictions are normal. Um, and therefore, that's a, directly, um, that's a direct lift from Marxist dialectics. Um, and as a question of how you resolve those contradictions, which is, you know, Mao's um, uh, 37 speech. And so at least at a level of methodology, uh, my t tentative assumption, the work that I've done, is that this is very much the uh, intellectual 
uh, framework for analysis uh, in which he engages in understanding domestic and world events. <clears throat> Second, in terms of the Shin Shidae, uh, like you, I've been to a thousand conferences now in which are Shin Shidae on you know, artichoke management and, um, <laughs> and uh, military affairs. Everything's a Shin Shidae these days. <laughs> and, um, new era. In the new era. Yeah. So um, I'm still puzzled as to what the new era is as well, but it's, it's new um, uh, and it's an era. Um, <laughs> Uh, but um, no, <laughs> no. But in my attempted analysis of what I think is driving changing worldview, what I've deliberately sought to do is to throw in uh, what I would see as three drivers. One is, I think, something we overlook, which is the changing structure of the Chinese economy and the growing importance of China domestic um, growth and demand as opposed to its international dependency. Uh, in other words, <clears throat> the need in this Xin Shidai to be wholly, uh, as it were, deferential to an external order materially is no longer as necessary as it was in the previous 35 years. In other words, the traded sector of the Chinese economy as has happened with the emergence of the continental American economy in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, is a graph which goes a bit like that. Trade is a great addition to national wealth, but it's no longer the central fueling dynamic of it. Um, now that's one factor. Where does that land you? Ultimately, at a level of nativism, um, which we've seen in, in America's case, and by the time you get to the early 20th century as well. Second driver um, is what you've correctly pointed to, which is the historical narrative. Shidadar is not just a dialectician. Um, he sees himself very much as the party historian, banan historian as well. Certainly the conversations I've had with him when I was in office were mainly about Chinese history, to the complete frustration of my officials. <laughs> so I'd just, you know, chat rather than get on with stuff. And, um, and um, uh, it's always a danger, you know, when you get into your own zone. Um, so the whole thing about pushing. Uh, and as for those who have studied this closely, it's not a uniquely Xi Jinping idea, the renovation, uh, sorry, the, uh, the renaissance or the rejuvenation of the Chinese people or, um, or nation, <coughs> not state, uh, has been around for a while, but he feels that. Um, and that's part and parcel of who he is and driven by the historical reflection, not just the a historical reconstruction of the period of foreign oppression. You've all read the news reports when he goes to look at the exhibition of uh, the Opium Wars and the Japanese, <coughs> and, then there's, and then you see in the printed version, and General Secretary Xi Jinping drew in his de breath deeply. <sighs> you know, it's not just that, it's actually real. And when you talk to him about this period, it is a genuinely felt and perceived vulnerability of the Chinese state during this period and the Chinese people during this period. So when he looks back at um, Qianlong telling Lord McCartney, go away, he kind of really likes that, okay? And um, given what happened after uh, Lord McCartney took that mes message back to the British 40 years later when they came with ships um, and guns and blew the country open. And the third element, the third driver is ideology. And that's what I've sought to inject into my remarks today. And for me, it's been a bit of a surprise. I mean, I've always seen, let's call it the Marxist patois, um, as, as really, a, um, uh, as really um, an external artifice. But the more I look at it, and I stand to be corrected the more work I do, uh, is that not just in this framework of dialectical analysis, <coughs> but in some of the content as well, we are looking at a, an active redefinition of the party's future mission, not just its historical role. Uh, and therefore, that's part of, let's call it Shin Shidai as well. So I think it's these three dynamics. I wish I could give more shape to the third at the stage of my research. I can't, but that's why I'm kind of doing it. I may come back to you in a year's time and say, sorry about that, got it completely wrong, but I'm fascinated by where I've got so far.
We have time for one time to close or one more question. Uh, <laughs> Professor Kirby, one final question. Okay, just uh, Kevin, that was a wonderful speech, and I think we all have a actually more coherent view of uh, President Xi's uh, worldview as as a result of this. Uh, uh, in a way that's actually much more compelling than his own speeches. Uh, but it's <laughs> but your title is China's worldview under Xi Jinping, not Xi Jinping's worldview. And you know, in Mao's day, there were alternative worldviews to those of Mao. Liu Xiaoqi had a different conception of socialism and a different <laughs> approach, much more Stalinist and <laughs> I suppose you would say regular of those days. Du under Deng Xiaoping, there were alternative voices as well, some seeking to slow down the pace uh, of reform. I think something that we all know who study China, that when we're in a moment where everybody is saying exactly the same thing in exactly the same words, mm. that's when there's real disagreement. Mm. Uh, and <laughs> the... I so noticed that just before I was what removed are, as leader of what my are, what are <laughs> So <laughs> what are, if you were to think ahead or think back, what are alternative China's alternative worldviews. The first time I came across the term Shu uh, Jieguan was actually from Tsai Yuanpei, returned scholar from Germany, from Leipzig, who used this as a kind of Humboldtian idea of mm -hmm. education. A student should have a Shu Jieguan Jiao Yu, a cosmopolitan, open, liberal view. Not, of course, what we're talking about here. But quite in, can, quite in. So, <laughs> what do you, under, what are, are there alternative? Are there alternative Chinese worldviews that you see as relevant today? Let me try and be brief in the conclusion because <clears throat> I think someone else has the room at, the, at six or whatever it is. <laughs> the, <clears throat> I don't know, but I, I'll, I'll try not to get anyone into trouble, um, including myself. The, um, <clears throat> in the last five years, uh, Bill, and why your question is so important, <clears throat> what we've seen in China is a contraction of the domestic political space. Um, that is, the space for public discourse on such questions. Uh, I'm not talking about public discourse on fundamental questions of party legitimacy, um, a la 1989. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a public discourse about, uh, let's call it, Xu Jieguan. And there are a number of there's a whole bunch of language which is used around this, but it's about the same central idea, which is how do we view ourselves <coughs> objectively, how do we view the world around us objectively, and what should we do about it? Um, and certainly within the domain of, let's call it, wider international relations, including um, what we would call IR, IPE, PE people, uh, in the academy, but also the people to whom they're linked in formal politics. Uh, the broad schools uh, that we're familiar with uh, in uh, the previous uh, couple of decades of uh, Chinese public policy evolution, there's certainly been a number of Xi Jiaquans, um, and one which is uh, broadly, shall we say, internationalist, uh, one which is uh, at one other end of it, liberal internationalist, uh, one which is um, much more nativist and nationalist and variations within them. And of course, the liberal internationalist uh, element uh, would be very much Humboldtian uh, in, its, uh, in its view. Uh, but I think what we see now is, uh, in terms of uh, Xi Jinping's China, is as formally articulated with the decision of the Ren Da and the abolition of term limits, is very much um, a, a Xi Jinping's China. Um, and um, that is the current reality. Uh, you've made the observation that now everyone speaks in the same patois about the same subject, which means it's very difficult to dig in as to what is happening. I think people are now quite concerned about the constraints that they now fi found, find their academic and general public policy discourse within China. Certainly that's what I hear um, you know, uh, when I roll around the country a fair bit. So are there, beneath the surface, the same Xu Jieguans, which were different, Buton to Xu Jieguans, um, but which are now somewhat di xia, uh, somewhat underground, or not di xia, but they are just not bu nong shuo. Yeah, they still exist. 
um, they're still there, but there is a remarkable degree of um, ideological and political um, unanimity uh, at present. And my concluding remark in this speech, which is, is this a permanent phenomenon? Is it temporary? As someone said recently about Xi Jinping's China, it's just the end of history. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, or not. Um, what we do know, and we must rationally respond to as the rest of the world, is that's the reality as it is. Uh, we know that Xi Jinping, barring um, uh, physical health, will be general secretary and president for the next five years. It's entirely conceivable he'll remain beyond that, given the removal of the constitutional limit. So therefore, it is what it is, and therefore, we work within it. Um, and therefore, the responsibility I find my, for myself, just as you know, a scholar, um, uh, is how do I try and make sense of this for every single political leader in the world who asks me this question, who the hell is this guy? What does he believe in? And what's he want to do? These are fair questions. Uh, if you're about to run the largest economy in the world and have an increasing global footprint. And so I think my response is let me try and try to get inside the, the siwe, the way of thinking which underpins this. Um, and it's, it's a fraught um, methodological exercise. We've got documents, yes, but documents are documents. There are what think tanks think, do and discuss that are dealing with the parties, you know, you know, dang de biwe. And that's good and you can get so far with that. <coughs> then you've got external evidence of change in political and external international behaviour. Yes, you can do that. What I'm trying to do is m bring these together to form some synthesis of analysis as to what really is changing here and what are its core contents of relevance both for China and the rest of us trying to make sense of China and what is actually continuity with some funny other stuff sitting around the outside of it and will it be Qianlong or will it be Kangxi? Mm. Yeah. I, I, I want to say a word. You have one more thing. Okay, go ahead. That's right. I want to say that uh, I think I express the feelings of everybody here that we're acutely aware that the conversations between our government and China are not what they should be. And we need all the help we can get of people who can help link us uh, to a better understanding of China and link the Chinese leadership with our leadership. And I think Kevin is an unusual position to do that from New York, and we appreciate his being in New York as the head of the uh, policy unit uh, at the Asia Society. And his knowledge of China, his ability to talk to leaders of the world, and to try to convey that communication. And I think as we look forward for the next 20 years of our Asia Center, uh, we're very appreciative that we were able to celebrate this event uh, with Kevin here. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Kevin, for a remarkable talk. To Ezra for introducing Kevin. For all of you for being here today, I uh, neglected to mention in the beginning that uh, this event is co-sponsored by the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies. Michael Zoni, director of the Fairbanks Center, has been tremendously helpful in helping us, uh, he and his staff, helping us organize this event. James Evans there. I saw Susan Lawrence uh, from the Korea Institute has been helping us as well. So thank you to all our uh, fellow centers and, of course, the staff of the Asia Center for uh, organizing the events today. Uh, we have a reception outside, which will uh, go on about 45 minutes. Uh, part of that will be a book signing. I believe you're signing copies of the book. And it's a really hefty tome titled, Not for the Faint Hearted. So, you know, the size and the title, very appropriate. It's a wonderful uh, discussion of Kevin's life, his experiences from childhood uh, on the farm. So uh, thank you again all for coming, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.